Yeah. The uh, sounds rolling, cameras rolling. So okay. whenever you're ready. Yeah. Well, Daniel, thanks. Thanks very much for okay. this. Um, could I start by you know, maybe taking you back to 1978 and mm -hmm. what was happening then in, in London and, and for yourself? And obviously, it was like mm -hmm. a seminal time. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't part of any scene at all. Um, I wasn't really, I was working quite hard. Uh, actually, I was um, working as an assistant film editor out in Boreham Wood at ATV, so I wasn't really in London that much. Um, I was listening to a lot of music that was coming out of the kind of punk and post-punk music and ordering records from Rough Trade. Um, but, I, but, and, but for me, what was really interesting was the possibilities of electronic music in relation to punk and um, for me electronic music was was kind of more punk than punk rock because you didn't really have to do very much <laughs> you didn't even have to learn three chords you just pressed a few buttons and made some nice sounds so that was what was going on in my head at that time and then I would admit I was a big fan of electronic music anyway and a fan of the energy of punk but not such a fan of all the punk rock music I mean it was good in the beginning but then it got kind of a bit tiring um, and so, yeah, and, and the DIY movement was just starting, your, your DIY records movement was just starting, and there were a lot of little articles, as famous, well, famous at the time, one by a group called the Desperate Bicycles, who, who printed, made their own record and distributed it themselves on, by bike, by bicycle. And they gave you a little manual of how to make your own record. So there was, you know, and it felt like it was the right time somehow for... And it definitely was the right time because independently of what I, completely independent of what I was doing around the country, people were doing the same thing. You know, whether it was Robert and Thomas or the Human League, Cabaret Voltaire, Throbbing Gristle, you know, the beginnings of Soft Cell and OMD all started pretty much exactly the same time for kind of the same reasons. Um, you know, synthesizers were becoming much more accessible. Recording equipment was becoming much more accessible. You didn't have to go into... I think we, Talking to everybody afterwards, you know, nobody really wanted like the idea of going to a recording studio because it was too much like rock and roll and a bit too kind of music business. So the fact that you could all make records in your own homes or in your own little your basements was something that I think appealed to everybody. And all that all kind of happened at the same time as the music changing. And obviously, around that time, there were three singles were almost singled out yeah. um, by the music press as, as this kind of mm. start of this new movement. Obviously your own mm. single with the normal yeah. Roberts and, mm. and Thomas's singles. Yeah. Do you have an idea of why those ones particularly were, were singled out and what it was about them? Well, I mean, first of all, I think, I think some people could see that it was the beginning of something new. Uh, that it was, I mean, there weren't very many singles like that out, if any at all, you know, to be honest, and m more electronic, more experimental, not, you know. And so I think, I think it was, ex you know, when you look, think about it in the context of what was happening musically at the time, those three singles probably sounded very different and exciting for people who were interested in, in how music might work out in the future. Do you, do you remember where you actually met Robert? Must have been around that time. Very, yeah, I remember actually quite clearly. Um, we were at the London Film Co-op, London Filmmakers Co-op, which was a legendary venue at the time, as well as being a film co-op, to see Robin Gristle play. And we were both just hanging around after the show by the stage. It's kind of everybody just introducing themselves, really, because I, I didn't know Robin Gristle at that time, uh, personally. Didn't know Robert, and there were a few other people. And we were just hanging out, and somehow we just introduced each other, you know, we introduced ourselves to each other. Yeah. Like, we're, okay, we're all doing roughly the same thing. Nice to meet you. Basically, that was it. And then Robert and I would, you know, we exchanged phone numbers and uh, yeah, and that's how we stayed in contact. I suppose on the back of that, how, how did you end up sort of working together? That must have come about quite quickly. Well, we, we there wasn't a plan to work together, but um, the guys who, there was a company who were doing promoting really interesting gigs at the time in London called Final, Final Solution. And they wanted to do a concert with the, uh, with the new electronic artists. And they had Throbbing Gristle, they had Cat the Cabs. Um, 
they had another group called Metamorphosis who were, didn't quite fit into that thing, but nevertheless were. And then they asked me and Robert individually if we wanted to do something. And I didn't really figure out what I could do. And, and I think Robert couldn't either. We'd been in touch a little bit in between. So I, either he phoned me or I phoned him and said, what do you write? What, have you heard about this gig? What are you going to do? And he said, I don't know. I can't really think. And I said, neither can I. So why don't we try and do something together? And that's kind of how it worked. There's, there's footage from the, the South Bank show that was made on Little Figures mm -hmm. about, um, was that the, the two of you are recording um, yeah. or, or rehearsing at that time in, yeah. in, in a sort of suburban bungalow? Yeah, that's my um, mum's house, yeah. That's your mum's house. Yeah. <laughs> um, did, did you actually record anything together or was it all rehearsing? Well, we were recording backing tracks because we played, we, we played to a backing tr a tape. And so we'd put some, I mean, we put some basic, rhythms down on I mean it was a yeah basic tape recorder put some rhythms down and then we just kind of improvised over it so we were working out some of the rhythms probably and some of the backing tracks at that point the only the only real so there were recordings of backing tracks but that they don't really mean very much in themselves mm -hmm. but there's the live the live record of course that was recorded at West Runton Pavilion um yeah with South yeah without that yes I mean that tour is we just thought we'd have a laugh yeah, and that went on to the Stiff Little Fingers or Rough Trade mm. tour of early 79. Mm. Uh, I was only given that it was less than a year after the, the Clash suicide tour, which was pretty riotous. Mm. Were, were you quite apprehensive about that tour? Or? No, I don't think we were apprehensive. I mean, we were wondering how it was going to go. I mean, it was supposed to be a very Rough Trade egalitarian kind of tour. But just at that time, just before the tour started, Stiff Little Fingers started to really explode and it was Rough Trade's first really big hit album. So they were very much the headliners. And they travelled separately from us and we travelled with uh, Essential Logic. It was Laura Logic who had been in X-Ray Specs. And um, we became friendly with them. But I think both Robert and I thought, well, they, you know, Rough Trade asked us to do it. And we thought, you know, let's have a little, in our, you know, we felt we were old at the time, you know, we were in our mid-20s. Mm -hmm thought, wow, this may be our one chance to have a bit of a rock and roll kind of lifestyle experience, which it was, you know, driving up and down the motorways in a van without heating, you know, staying in terrible hotels. And But the gigs themselves were mixed from, when I say mixed, they were either, I mean, our performances were okay, but in terms of response, they were mixed from being very bad to absolutely awful. <laughs> um, we had some quite hairy nights, I would say, on stage. You know, pe I mean, people gobbing, throwing stuff. There was, I remember one in particular, the Digbeth City Hall in Birmingham, where, I mean, we ended, the stage was just strewn with bottles and chains and cigarette ends, lit, lit cigarettes, and it was horrible. And we kind of looked at each other at certain points, and we both said, no, let's just keep, we're not going to, we're not backing down, you know. But the one th the thing that was great about it was that, um, after every show, there's like one or two people who came back stage and said, wow, that was amazing. That was the best thing we'd ever seen. It's something, a new world for us, you know. And we were, that's what we were trying to do in a way, was turn people on to that kind of possibilities. So who knows what those people went on to do. But, you know, if one or two people love it, that's great, you know. And, um, and we got, became friendly with Stiff Little, uh, with, well, with Stiff Little Fingers, but also with Essential Logic. And actually, one of the guys in Essential Logic, William Bennett, then went on to be White House and, he was very inspired by what we were doing as well. So that's quite nice to know that it kind of, it sort of os osmosis happens, you know. And, and following that Stiff Little Fingers tour, there were some European dates that I hadn't heard about before until mm -hmm. Hillary showed me some of the press cuttings. So. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really, we did, a, we did three nights in one club in Paris called the Gibus, which is known, it was, you know, punk bands were playing there and the promoter there was uh, a guy called Giri, a Czech guy who lived in Paris. He was really into the, into the music and you, the deal was you got, you booked, you were booked for three nights, you got a whole hotel room and your me and meals and I think they paid the fare to get there and that was it. And uh, it was a kind of, I mean, the hotel, the first hotel they put us up in was like basically a, a one hour hotel and we had to move because it was just, you know, we couldn't sleep. And, and, and yeah, you know, it was pretty rough, basically. 
but we had we enjoyed ourselves but we i think there was a bit of tension at that point between us maybe i can't remember but we we both were drinking a lot on stage and we almost had i think we almost had a punch up on one night and there's a guy there called simon leonard who's in a who's in a band called i start counting at the time oh. fortran five later he came, he was he came along to the gigs he's a fr he was oh, we already knew him and he had to, i think he jumped on stage and kind of separated us but they were kind of riotous gigs. I mean, you know, it wasn't really, it was, I, you, you turn up, you do a sound check and you come back to do the gig and everything had been unplugged. It was kind of a bit like that. And so we, and that made us stressed out. So we were just drinking more and then kind of, and, and uh, Robert, and it was very hot in the club and humid. And when you have, when, uh, if, and Robert had a wasp and the wasp keyboard, which is touch sensitive, once it gets beyond a certain temperature and humidity, it starts playing itself. And uh, yeah, that happened a lot, but we had, I mean, we had fun, you know, of course, three nights in Paris, it's great, you know. Um, obviously after that, um, Robert went on to record a single for Mute mm -hmm. in early 1980. Yeah. Um, was, the, was there talk about doing, maybe doing an album around that time? Or? Well, at that time, we weren't making albums, actually. <laughs> we were, yeah, a single. And yeah, I want, you know, at various times after that, I really wanted to, Robert to make an album, but, and he, he was in our, over the years, he'd spent quite a lot of time in our studio, but never really, you know, he was one of those, he, he was, he was never really happy with what he did, you know, however good it was, he, he found it difficult to let go of that and put it out there, which was really sad because he did some really great stuff. Um, but unfortunately, no, we didn't, we didn't, never got to the point of putting out anything else. I suppose from a public perspective, um, Robert seems to s disappear at this mm. point. Um, what, what was your understanding about why Robert stopped releasing material after that? I think it was what I was just talking about. I think his lack of, what you call it perfectionism or his lack of desire, you know, he just didn't want to put stuff out there. Of course, he did the record with Thomas, The Bridge, after that. So that was a, a big, you know, that was an important record. Um, but, I th yeah, I don't know. I kind of lost touch with him a little bit at that point. Uh, various times we got back in touch. But, you know, I think our lives took kind of separate routes at that point. I, I, he, you know, I was trying to encourage him to do more music. He didn't seem to really want to do it at that time. Mute was kind of moving in a different direction. I mean, the, we were play when we were playing together, um, uh, the couple of guys who managed Wire... Um, Brian Grant and Mike, um, Mike, Mike and Brian Grant um, were interested in managing us, and um, the, the, they'd seen us in Manchester. The first gigs we did after the Crypt was a little tour with Prague Vec, and we played at Manchester, the Manchester Factory, as it was then, which before you know before Factory, even before Factory Records, but Tony Wilson was down there, and they were there, and they said. Oh, you know, um, Wire are big fans of, your, of you guys. And we thought, wow, because we were big fans of Wire. We met up with Wire as well down in London. They were really nice people and really... And the managers were interested in managing us and that we didn't really know what we were doing. This is really before Mute started as a label apart from my single. So, and they started saying, look, guys, if you want us to manage us, you know, if you want us to manage you, let us know. You know, we're really interested. I think at that point, Robbie said, we don't really want managers. I don't think we really want to work together that much. We want, want to go our own, not in a bad way, but just, you know, I think we've done our bit as a duo. So that, I think that's, you know, that's one of the, you know, that, that was a quite important moment when we kind of said, okay, let's go our own way, you know. I suppose even, um, you know, 15 years after Robert's death and you know, 35 years after his last recording, there's still a great affection for and reverence for Robert's work. Mm. God, is it 15 What's, years? Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you attribute that to, the, this ongoing kind of... Well, I think, for, I mean, I think he, I think it was incredibly emotional, his, 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 his work. Had, I mean, his voice was, you know, was incredible and had, was, had a lot of, and I think that was kind of different from what a lot of people were doing at the time. I mean, certainly mine, mine was virtually just spoken word, and he, but his voice was just incredibly emotional. Um, and he made the small amount of music that he released it was all extremely good so I think 
there's a people will, I, you know, the people who follow it would rightly be wondering what else was there. Was there anything else? Is, what would it have been? What could it have been? And I think that sort of, I don't know if you want to call it mystique or whatever you want to call it, um, perpetuates that interest, you know, and, and the combination of the music and the kind of lack of music out there, the quality of the music and the lack of it at the same time, you know. What, what would you say the sort of legacy of, of Robert's work is to a younger generation? Yeah. Well, you know, people, it's out there and people are influenced by it. People, you know, it's, it still sounds great, still sounds contemporary. And I think, you know, I, you know the, the, there are a lot, a lot of people I bump into, mus other musicians, younger musicians, DJs, who were very into that scene and very into Robert's thing. And, you know, it, it's, it was part of a culture, very much a, a part of a culture that was very special at that time, which was very important was very influential for the next generation of musicians, you know, as certain things were influential for us, like with all, with all inf influences. I think a lot of people were looking at that period and, the, the, and, and were very influenced by it. And of course, Robert was very much part of it. And um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the Bridge album was, was mm -hmm. re-released by Mute. Uh, yeah. Even that was some 15 years ago now, I think. No, longer, 25 more, more, years, yeah, yeah. 25 yeah. years. At um, least, yeah. Paul will know the answer to that. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think it's 25 years, yeah. uh, pretty much. Um, you know, are, are there still plans to, I've heard rumours about it might be coming out on a vinyl release or... Yeah, I think, I th yeah, we, yeah, I th again, that's probably a better question for Paul, but yeah, we, I mean, we, of course we try and, because of the rise of, the, re, the rise of vinyl, we try and make everything available on vinyl now, so now we, def we would definitely want to do that if we can, yeah. I suppose, is there anything else that you would like to um, say about Bob that I've maybe not covered? Or? Um, no, I just remember, you know, going to his flat, or their flat. Yeah. And, you know, we worked half in my place and half at their place, and it was, yeah, I, I know, I'm not, I'm nothing specific really, just, just memories of being at the flat, and you know, they had a, it was quite high up. I can't remember what floor it was on. Yeah, Macy House, was that? Yeah. Was it, was it, wasn't it third or fourth? I think because was because um, Dylan was only three or four at that Yeah, time. I remember Dylan, of course, yeah, yeah running around. And uh, how's he doing? He's good, yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, he lives in Wales, um, near Hill, in yeah. Paris. With, he's got two kids now. Great. Yeah. Well, wow. He's been in his forties, which is... <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, yeah, it's, I know. It's scary. It? <laughs> but, um, yeah, we had, you know, we had... we. Yeah, I, you know, I remember we had a lot of talks about music. We both had very similar tastes in music, uh, on one hand, and very different on the on another in another part. You know, and he was quite into sort of ambient music, the you know thing, and I hated that at the time. Yeah. Uh, but I'd hate it. I, it just wasn't my thing at the time. So we never, you know. So it was, when we were working on our set, it's like how we would do it. We both decided that um, we wouldn't do our singles as well when we yeah. played live. I mean, we only did, at that time we just put a single out each, but we played kind of, we did kind of mashups of the two singles together. That was part of the backing track. You couldn't really hear it as to that, but that was conceptually um, how we did that. Um, so the, the people say you didn't play your single. So yeah, we played it. You just didn't hear it. You know? and there was one. Like TG shortening it to sixteen. Yeah, seconds. exactly. Yeah, and there was one night because we were on the stiff little fingers tour. Of course, we were touring and it, you know it was playing every night pretty much. And we had the tape, and one night um, we forgot to rewind the tape, and we were at Eric's in Liverpool, and we, of course we didn't go to sound checks. We just put the tape on as normal, and we pressed play, and it was running backwards. So we just decided to do the gig backwards. <laughs> sounds about right. It sounds about right, you know. Yeah. We were, it was quite kind of conceptual in that way, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, we had yeah. Um, we had good times. good times. Yeah, it was a good time.